I had been appointed there as chief naval test pilot, so much of my work was associated with deck landing and catapulting. But in addition, I was in aerodynamics flight, and eventually, in fact, became this, the commanding officer of aerodynamics flight. And that threw me into a, quite a different ball game, because we were mainly involved in transonic testing, trying to get our craft as near to breaking the sound barrier as possible. Although we appreciated that in piston engine aircraft, because of the propeller, it was impossible to go supersonic. Indeed, there were some, not many, but there were some who believed the sound barrier couldn't be broken at all. The big hope, of course, of breaking it and improving on all the transonic speeds was the advent of the jet engine. And we had the top secret jet flight here at Farnborough, and I was moved into that in about May 1944. It was a very exciting phase of aviation. We had Frank Whittle's first jet aircraft, the Gloucester E2839. We had the first Meteor. We had the first United States jet aircraft, the Bell Era Comet, and we had a funny little aircraft which was at that time named the de Havilland Spider Crab, which, which eventually was renamed to be the Vampire. So one of the most interesting things we were involved in was there was a project to break the sound barrier with an aircraft which was designed by Miles but was designed under guidelines from the REE. It was in fact really an REE project and it was going to be monitored throughout its design stage and put into the wind tunnels here and generally monitored throughout. It was also to be flown by an REE pilot. And I received, it was shortly after May 1944, I received a memo from the then director here, Mr. W. S. Farron, saying that I should start taking a lively interest in the Miles M52 because I was being nominated as one of the two pilots that would one of us would make the first flight. Now I suppose this made sense because A, I was in the jet flight and none of the Miles people had any experience of jet flying. Secondly, there was the question of my stature because the Miles M52 cockpit, the total diameter of the cockpit was only four feet and nobody over about five feet eight was going to be able to get into this cockpit in which you lay virtually semi-supine with the nose wheel retracting between your legs. Uh, not the best place for it to retract, but there, nevertheless, there you were. And the other fellow who was nominated with me was about the same stature as me. The difference between us was I had been told by the Admiralty that I was going to stay at Farnborough long term, whereas the other fellow wanted to get out as soon as the war was over. So the odds were on that I was going to be the, the chosen chap. Now, as you know, the project was cancelled, and we were very, very upset about it because we believed it, it could work. And of course, we did the thing that. Britain does so often, we gave all the information to the United States. And they used it, and of course they were the first there. Now the proof that it would have worked was that we, in 1948, by this time the Americans had broken the sand barrier, but we took a model of the M52, fitted with a little rocket engine in the tail, 
took it up in a mosquito uh, to altitude over the Scilly Isles and unleashed it and monitored it by telemetry. And it was last seen vanishing into the, over the Atlantic during Mach 1.38, which showed the tremendous potential of the wing. Of course, it was a rocket motor, not a jet engine, so that we wouldn't have managed to get as high as that. But we were hoping to get up to about 1.07.